Hello, everyone. Welcome to Product Costume. Uh, how many are Product Costume members? Great, great. Well, welcome to Product Costume members and the others who are not Product Costume members. Uh, please become members. It's free. Uh, what was the next question I had? Oh, we just celebrated uh, one year. Uh, the longest of speakers over the last year. Um, the most recent speaker was uh, Kenneth Berger from Slack. And the next one is uh, Sean Ellis, the guy who, turned, who coined the term growth hackers is gonna be here in December. Um, how many are signed up for the December event? Okay, the others, please take a look at it and uh, sign up for that. Um, today we've got a a dynamic, extremely interesting speaker. Um, I had the privilege to work with Lam at Rackspace briefly, and what a time it was. Um, so Lam Napier is the founder of Bill Group, Austin's newest venture capital firm. Uh, They're trying to make a big difference to the Austin uh, startup scene, and uh, I wish Lam the best. Lam was president and CEO of Rackspace. Thank you. And, uh, an enthusiast for creating the service culture that drives Rackspace's fanatical support philosophy. I just think that there are only two tech companies truly from uh, Austin. One was Dell 30 years ago, that uh, was created with the kind of size, you know, 60 billion plus revenues. And then next, anything that comes close to it is Rackspace. Uh, that's it. The rest of the companies have all been roll-up strategies, you know, uh, <coughs> PE buyouts, this, that, everything. Truly original, completely different. Uh, only two companies in the last 30, 30 plus years that I have seen, and uh, one is Dell, a long time ago, and most recent success is Rackspace. So that's something remarkable. We just don't have such successes often, right? It's very extraordinary. So, and Lion joined Rackspace in April 2000 and recognized early on that the company's unique service culture and its employees, the Rackers, were core to Rackspace's success. He began championing efforts to build the company's world-class customer service model that today is known as fanatical support. Lamb's commitment to providing Rackers with the same fanatical support provided to its customers has made Rackspace a globally <coughs> recognized winning workplace and one of the best places to work, including its fortune rankings as one of the 100 best companies to work for. Lamb has played a critical role not only in Rackspace's survival during the tech industry meltdown of 2000, but also in the company's continued growth. Under his leadership, Rackspace has grown from a privately held company with fewer than 100 Rackers to the service leader in cloud computing. Lanham has been recognized by Forbes as one of America's 15 most powerful CEOs, 40 and under, and was named one of the top 100 most influential executives by Everything Channel's CRM. Lanham has also been honored by Ernst & Young as an Entrepreneur of the Year and as a member of the Young President's Organization and Entrepreneur's Organization. Lanham has a bachelor's degree in economics from Rice University and graduated with an MBA from Harvard Business School. It is an absolute pleasure for all of us to welcome Lanham. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is all this stuff working? I got all sorts of gadgets. Okay, first of all, that intro is old. I'm no longer under 40. But I look better. So there's just more up. Okay. You got it now? Oh, fanatical. Come on, up slice. Got it. Sorry. Just a quick note, folks. Uh, the hashtag for this event, if you want to live speak it, uh -huh. is product account product offer. So feel free to do that. And there's one mm -hmm. line code posted on uh, this wall over here. Over there. Sorry, we'll have in just a second. We had it earlier. Oh, seeds. Okay. Um, yeah, so now everybody hear me okay? Yes. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah. Hashtag for this and product to custom is the hashtag. They want to tweet about it, like tweet about it. Tweet away. <laughs> now that I'm no longer a public company guy, I can say all sorts of shit. So it's really, it's just, this is going to be good. All right, so um, here's the, the general plan. All right, uh, I got like 20 slides. I'm not really a slide guy. You know, I, I'm reformed. Okay, so we'll hustle through these things at whatever pace you want. And then after that, you can launch whatever scud missile you want by a direction. I'm happy to answer questions to the best of my ability for as long as you want to stay until about eight. 
<laughs> then I'm off the clock, dude. Okay, so uh, first of all, thank you for having me over. Um, when I talk to um, your product meetup founders about what to talk about, right, what they suggested was trying to go from, to give you a perspective from, you know, CEO perspective around going from a, a seed to a billion dollar company or go private to public, you know, all that kind of stuff. All right, so um, we'll get into some of that. And now, can you just give me a, a quick feel for your functions? How many of you sort of product folks? Vast majority, I would think, right? Okay, uh, more general management kind of stuff? Okay, uh, any others? HR? <laughs> any lawyers? <laughs> <laughs> Don't answer your lawyer, dude. Okay. Um, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, lawyer jokes never get old. Okay, so anyway. So what we're going to talk about is how to go from C to, you know, something beyond C to where you're having fun. And my perspective on this stuff is I want to share with you things. Oh, sorry, one quick question. Do I need to stand still? That's freaking hard for me. Walk where? I can walk with that? You're not? Okay. Got you, dude. All right. So um, I'm, I'm just, I'll just try to stay in this little box. Um, so the way I think about this is I want to help you on your journey, okay? I don't want to give you a bunch of theoretical garbage uh, that you can read elsewhere, okay? Uh, I'm much more in you know, school of how it worked for us, not to say it's going to work for you, okay? Because I think every situation is a little bit different. Um, I think in business there are only a few universal truths. You know, the rest is situation specific. All right, so we can get into uh, some of that. Uh, and then lastly, you know, in our new life here as uh, investors, admittedly, we're making up as we go along, but our mission and purpose is really about doing for you what was not done for us from an investment point of view. Okay, so I, I, uh, I consider myself very blessed and fortunate to get to do what I did. I'm the son of school teachers. I'm a nerd. You know, um, I got a couple kids. I got a beautiful wife. And I got to work with people I cared about for a long time on technology that I thought made a difference. And so I just want to hope, you know, you get to do the same, right? It's a hell of a good way to go through life, right? I mean, it really was, you know, not quite tap dance to work, but at least go at a reasonable pace. All right, so here are seeds. How many of you are in seed country? <laughs> not that many, okay. So you're somewhere in between. How many of you are in this country? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> no, okay, so we're somewhere in between this and that. All right, so I'm a big fan of Dr. Evil. All right, I, I don't know if y'all like him or not, but I think he's actually quite wise. And he has an incredible relationship with his son. So <laughs> when you start your journey from seed to Dr. Evil, all right, guys, look, trust me, once you get big, you will be labeled evil. You know this, right? And how many of you do not know that? No, you know that. Come on. I mean, I watched this great spoof on Conan earlier about Michael Dell and the merger with EMC, and that is hilarious if you haven't seen it. I mean, it's hilarious. But this, you get successful, people think you're evil. Okay, so we're going to try to be a Dr. Evil country. The first thing you gotta do is master strategery. All right, so um, here's how I think about strategery in general, okay? It's, it's hard. I think people um, underestimate the difficulty with which they're trying to discover something that's great inside of a strategy. And so there are a few practical things I wanna talk about. All right, and the first practical example is uh, David and Goliath. Okay, so how many of y'all are Gladwell fans? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, so I thought he did a great analogy when he went through this thing, and I think it's a, entirely appropriate to small businesses as we're trying to grow. Okay, and so the points that we can look around to lots of successful companies, I think the first point is around specialization. The reality is, I think in today's marketplace, tyranny of the urgent exists. There's so much stuff going on, particularly as the little company, you know, we can only basically own one thing. We have to specialize in that one thing. We've got to be best in the world at it. All right, the reality is, as we are building our companies, we are all outgunned by somebody else, right? There's always somebody who raised more money. Right? There's always somebody with more resources. There's always somebody who's got uh, you know, more customers or whatnot running around. And so ultimately, we have to substitute our brains for their checkbook, okay? We have to substitute all, you know, superior thinking for their assets. And I think David is a heck of a good example of that, right? He only showed up with one weapon, a slingshot. If he missed, he could probably pick up and get another rock, right? So that's good thinking. Much different than chunking a spear at somebody. All right, and when you look at his uh, physical attributes relative to Goliath, he's quick, he's light, he can move around, Goliath is loaded up with armor, he can't see very well, you know, David kicks his butt. So the moral of the story here is that, you know, size isn't the only thing that matters. And I think as we are building our companies from scratch, understanding how to specialize around something that truly makes us unique and important. And so the frame I would offer you is really around what is it that you can do best in the world? I mean, literally better than anybody else, even if there are only three of you. And once you discover that, figure out how to create a strategy around it. 
And so we think about being best in the world. I would say you can only own uh, one thing, right? Remember City Slickers you know, with Curly, you know, one thing. You, you gotta find your one thing, all right? We meet with uh, lots of entrepreneurs in town and they have one thing over and over and over again. It's just not the same one thing, okay? They have this sort of blockchain of ones. Um, and I, I think that what happens it's hard to stay disciplined and ruthlessly prioritize around one thing. It's difficult, right? It is difficult. And, and so I think that when you look at the marketplace, the best brands in the world kind of stand for one thing, right? So I say Volvo, you think safety, safety right? Um, you want to do another one? <laughs> <laughs> right? All sorts of things. Okay, RC Cola, what do you think of? Crap, probably. I don't know. <laughs> Something that doesn't sell. Okay. Um, <laughs> that was a head fake. Okay. It's just like your field sobriety test. They won't mess with you, dude. Okay. So I think that basically what we can do is we build our companies, specialize on something that makes you powerful, right? That you can do better than anybody else in the world. And then when you communicate that specialization and that capability, you really are only going to get it on one thing. I think this is part of Microsoft's confusion. You know, I don't know what Microsoft stands for. If you ask my son who's 15, he thinks it's Xbox Assassin's Creed. Okay, my first job was investment banking analyst. I think it's Excel. All right, other people, who knows what they think it is. It's that they don't think smartphone. Okay, so I don't know what um, that brand stands for anymore. When I mean, you think about the most valuable, compelling brands in the world, whether it's Coca-Cola and this notion of Americana, you know, or Apple, which everyone likes to reference, um, I think that the, the world's best brands and best companies have a value system that you understand. And it tends to resonate around one super powerful point. Okay, so if you're interested in doing more sort of, um, you know, research around this, I think the start with why stuff is actually really good. And if you can make the, the notion of start with why the essence of your brand promise and your one thing, that is crazy powerful. All right, and so when you start to go with your strategy, I think it starts with, let's specialize. Let's pick one thing. And when you get into the nuts and bolts of it, I'm a fan of nuclear fusion. Okay, so that what you gotta have something inside of your strategy gives it a, it's gotta release energy inside the marketplace. It's gotta release energy in your company. Um, it's gotta release energy inside your employees. It's gotta release <coughs> energy inside of customers and prospects. And you need something to where the sum of the parts is tremendous. All right, that you're a sum of the parts type outcome. You know, like the San Antonio Spurs, right? I mean, those folks win championships and they don't have that other than a couple of Hall of Famers, you know, they're not that stacked. Okay, but they're Hall of Famers over the hill. And so somehow they, they've created this mechanism to where literally they got like basketball nuclear fusion. Okay, so it turns out at Rackspace, you know, we had one of these. And so for those of you that are systems thinkers, you know, you'll just call it a reinforcing loop. All right, but here was our nuclear fusion feedback loop. Okay, at Rackspace. It's pretty darn simple. Can, how many of y'all can actually see that? Not that many? Okay, well, here's the deal. It's a reinforcing loop. Okay, it starts with Rackers doing fanatical support and products to customers. Knock a customer's socks off, they will give you loyalty. With their loyalty, they'll give you growth and money. With growth and money, you can hire more Rackers, do more fanatical support, create more product. You get this nice, wonderful, you know, reinforcing virtuous cycle. So this was our loop. Turns out um, Amazon had a better one. Okay, this is theirs. Um, I didn't think of that one. I wish I had. It's clearly more valuable. All right, but this is the one I had. All right, so um, this is something I would say we all discovered together over time. I think it took uh, literally like three or four years to embrace it. Okay, so I think as you're building your business, there are gonna be these little gold nuggets in there that at some point, um, it just kind of dawned on you, holy crap, that's actually part of our superpower. And I think what you wanna do when you figure out your strategy, there are different ways to discover this. One way we discovered this was we found a tactic that worked and we just did more of it. Right, so we started to build a strategy of nested and loops around tactics that work. And then after a while, we started, we came across this thing called the service profit chain. And then we found this thing called, you know, the customer loyalty effect. And we got deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And then really, man, it kind of takes care of itself once you figure it out. All right, and so I would encourage you as you're designing your products, as you're designing your company, to think deeply about what reinforcing loops are in there that you can exploit. And yeah, there are lots of business strategy books out there that talk about differentiation, you know, competitive dynamics, all that kind of baloney, all right? That's important baloney. I just think, end of the day, if you want to create a company that's gonna get really large and grow at a high rate, you've gotta have a company full of reinforcing loops. And some of the best loops are when you create this notion of it, it begets more growth and more profit and more resources. And if you can stay focused on that and you can make the power of that one thing 
put in the middle of the power that one thing, your loop, I think you have a really great chance of building a company that grows at a high rate for a long time. And so when we discovered our loop, you know, part of what we did was we went to go look for the biggest coefficient in the loop, and that turned out to be Rackers. All right, so when you know, you're talking about, oh, you know, best company to work for, all this kind of stuff, you can talk to Toolbox in the back there, John I tell, um, you know, we were doing that because it was the right reason, okay? It's good to go through life and be nice to people and treat them well, but you know what? The other thing is a cold-hearted capitalist, it actually made us a lot of money too, all right? So the, the notion here is um, when we looked at our nuclear fusion feedback loop starting with Rackers, they were absolutely drove this flywheel for us, and so we had to create the conditions under which they could do great work. And we had to do it authentically. You know, we had to care about them. Otherwise, you know, the, the loop wasn't gonna work. The feedback would break down, and we would build a negative loop, not a positive loop, a balancing loop instead of a reinforcing loop. And so once we discovered this was the biggest coefficient, we actually went to work around creating measurement and management systems to make that possible. Okay, so what I would tell you is that when you, you know, step one is to figure out your strategy, I think you need to find within your strategy these reinforcing loops and your strategy needs to compound. And I would tell you things in life compound and it's not just math. All right, I think relationships compound. And I kind of, I believe in karma. All right, I think if you do the right thing, all that kind of stuff pays back to you. I think um, how you treat people compounds. I think how you treat customers compounds. I think how you treat former employees compounds. All right, I mean, I generally think that what you want to find inside your strategy is this notion of your economic tactic that's a reinforcing loop that the world values, that makes you powerful. And then I think I would apply that thinking elsewhere inside of your business without trying to quantify it. You know, not everything that, that matters gets measured. You know, and so I would, I would encourage you to think broadly about it. And now that we're talking about management systems, okay, we'll talk about metrics and measures. And there's all those um, sayings about how, you know, what, what gets measured gets done, you know, kind of stuff. And so I want to share with you just a few of the practical measures we follow that I think made a difference. Okay, so back to this notion of the biggest coefficient of trackers. You know, we went down this path with Gallup called the Q12. Um, it's admittedly a little bit complicated, but I think it works it. All right, we live in a, a world where all these companies say the most valuable people are their employees and whatnot, but then they don't do a great job taking care of them. And I would say that inside of your companies, one of the biggest competitive advantages you can have is your employees' discretionary effort. Right, it's hard to get discretionary effort. You know, we live in an instant gratification world, and discretionary effort often meets trading off Super Bowl parties for extra work. Okay, and so if you can create a culture where people volunteer their extra effort for you, I think your company's got an advantage. And so one of the measurement systems we use to measure this discretionary effort was around employee engagement, and Gallup does a good piece of work there. Okay, so if you're ever wondering where to get after that stuff, look, they cost a lot of money, just call me, I'll give you the open source version. Okay, um, so I actually did put Gallup on that slide, I'm proud of myself for that. Okay, but I'll give you the open source version, we'll talk it through, instead of the Q12, it'll be the Q9. Okay, because three of those questions I never really quite understood. All right, <laughs> it's true, they're hard, they're complicated. Okay, then the next one around um, customer engagement was Net Promoter Score, okay, NPS. Uh, how many of y'all know this one? Most of you, that makes Fred Wright Kill happy. Okay, um, so we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but I think from an executive level, if you know the people that work in the company are feeling good and you're getting discretionary effort, and you know your customers are happy and you're getting good net promoter scores, okay, and if ever you want to talk about that, I'm happy to you know, go into the weeds with you on that one. That's a good one as well. And then ultimately, you know, you'll get to this customer lifetime value thing. And it will <coughs> there are all sorts of operational metrics, okay, that you can make yourself go silly with. Um, I wouldn't have said well. Okay, I'd let somebody else do that for you. Okay, because the funny thing about metrics is the people that have the most metrics never actually know what's going on. Okay, <laughs> and here's why. It's because part of their metrics are positive and part of them are negative. And humans have this great capacity to rationalize. Okay, so you walk into a hypothesis, you look at the positive points, say, hey man, things are getting better. And you ignore the negative points. Or if somebody's in a bad mood, they can pound you all day long or over all your negative metrics. All right, so my and I used to experience this regularly with stockholders. So my uh, recommendation for you, I would just pick a few at a high level and stick with them, and let the rest of the company do all the uh, you know, operational type metrics and talk, talk each other in circles, okay? <laughs> and so now that we're talking about people, um, you know, let's dig into uh, what I think is absolutely the most important job of a leader, okay? And I think it's actually very simple, all right? And so uh, this guy, Marcus Buckingham, taught me this. And basically, I think your only job as a leader is to rally people to a better future. The rest of it, I think, is tactics. 
hire the right people, you know, set up the conditions, all that kind of stuff. We talk about values, all those things. But ultimately, I think your whole job as a leader is to rally people to a better future. That you have to help them believe they can do more than they realize they can. You know, if you, uh, a friend of mine who's a Navy SEAL, their whole thing is there's this 10x equation that when you're exhausted, there's another 10x in you, you just don't realize it. Okay, and I think this is part of what we all face as entrepreneurs is that, look, we are, we are David in this battle, we are not Goliath, and we gotta find that extra 10x. It'd be nice if it were a 12x. Okay, and ultimately the path to doing that, I think as a leader, is you gotta rally people to a better outcome. You know, everything you do is scrutinized. Every word you say, every meeting you have, everything you don't do is scrutinized as well. You know, people have an amazing capacity to pay attention to everything you do when you're the leader. Okay, and it's because you matter a lot. You matter a lot, and, and I think there's a sacred trust between leaders and people that work with them because they are placing their faith in you. You know, we live in a world that's a little bit crazy on the faith thing. Okay, and as far as the sacred trust being broken between employees and companies, look what Volkswagen did to all of us. You know, this is nuts. Okay, uh, actually on an Audi, I'm still pissed about it. But anyway, so I think the notion here that when you're the leader, if you want to geek out on leadership stuff, I'm happy to do that as well. Okay, but I think ultimately, man, you, you just gotta look after folks. You gotta help them, you gotta set the example. And if you rally them to a better future, they will knock your socks off. People are these, we may all be technologists, but you know, humans are the best technology. Okay, and I think it will, um, they'll surprise you with their inner capabilities. Okay, and then when you get to team building, you know, here's a little bit of, of bad news, okay? I, I think that as you go from a company of a certain size, the reality is leaders in particular hit their heads and tap out on you. All right, and, and what happens there is, um, in my experience, it's correlated to how well uh, I could develop people, all right, and how well they could grow. And it's, uh, when a company's growing 50% a year, it's hard to find people that can grow their capability 50% a year. And the reality is to be a leader, I think if the company's growing 50, you've probably gotta increase your capability 75, because you need to be ahead, not on par. You know what I mean? And, and so I think that what I draw this uh, you know, silly atom up here for is I think when you're picking your team, you need to have a nucleus that can go a long time with you. Right, you can trade out the edges, you know, the, a team's capacity for change uh, and trading out the edges varies by team and conditions, all right? But I, you can absolutely trade out the edges. But if you don't have a solid nucleus around you, I don't think you're gonna make it. And you know, when you go home tonight, if you walk away with anything from this presentation, I think real hard about, do you have that nucleus? And if you don't, I go get it. Or you're not gonna make it, man. You're not gonna, you might as well, you know, face the music, take the pain now. And we were lucky at Rackspace to have a nucleus of a handful of folks that were there for the duration, that cared about it, that, you know, bled for it, that loved it, and we could have great little fights and disagreements and end up on the same page later. And I think when you're building the team around you, you've gotta look for that, all right? And it's okay to trade out around the edges. The team can sustain it, but the team really can't sustain a, a trade out of the nucleus. Okay, so those are my sort of practical points for you. Then I decided to write some musings, okay, and I've never, um, presented this before, so this is gonna be fun. Hashtag, this is gonna be fun. All right, so things I discovered along the way. Can y'all read that in the back? Yeah, a little bit, sort of, toolbox, you can't read that? I got some cheaters, but they're only one and a half, so they're for reading close. So is there anything on here in particular you guys wanna talk about? Because I like these things. Okay, my favorite one is number two. You know, I tried to hire HR leaders, I stink at it. And the reason why is HR leaders know all the questions and answers, because all they do is interview people all day long. Okay, and so literally, hiring HR people, I found to be most difficult. I mean, it's a nightmare. Okay, so if you're hiring an HR leader, I don't really have any good advice for you. <laughs> it's just how it goes. You know, the other thing I learned over time that uh, is obvious now, but I didn't realize it until later, is that at the beginning when people sign up for your mission, you know, they're entrepreneurs like you, right? They're taking the risk. You know, if they want to make more money, they'll go work for Bolero or something. Um, so they're showing up to you to work for a low salary and equity, and they believe in the mission. And then what happens eight years later when you're successful is a whole different type of cat that shows up. Right, the people that wouldn't think about applying for that job when you were three million in sales show up when you were 803. Okay, and it's a very, it's a different value system, it's a different risk profile, and so it's interesting how they operate. And this just compounds later. You know, back to that crazy feedback thing, because one begets another. You know, they're kind of like rabbits. All right, so um, anything else you want to talk about on this page? Yes, sir. Number four, please. 
Number four, don't worry too much about the competition. It's more about what you do for or to yourself versus what others do to you. Yeah, I, I'm a big believer that we control our own outcomes. And while we need to be thoughtful about what's going on in the world around us, it's more about what we do than what anyone does to us. And I, in my own experience, I feel like a lot of people just obsess about what's going on all the time. And, and if they do that, I feel like they're in this uh, land of constant course corrections instead of being able to pick a path and march toward it. Look, I'm a fan of course corrections. I never once hit a plan, I either beat it or missed it. I never actually hit the number. It's impossible. Okay, so I, I think it's more about let's just make adjustments along the way. And that's what's driving that. There's another hand over here, yes, sir. Yeah, could you elaborate on number three, please? Number three, we were all a work in progress, former roster of coaches. Yeah, okay, dude. Sorry, sir. <laughs> so <laughs> here's how I think about this one. Um, I, this example is not as relevant as it used to be, but Tiger Woods has a swing coach. You know, so I, I remember reading about him one time, so I was admired. I, I think building a company is a human performance event. So I study excellent pieces of human performance. You know, those are cool things. And so he took me through his, he's got a swing coach and like a health coach and all this kind of coach stuff. I thought, holy crap, if that guy needs a swing coach, I need all sorts of coaches. So I basically built a roster of coaches for myself. A strategy coach, a marketing coach, a tech coach, and a I had a board coach. <laughs> that one didn't work out as well for me. All right? But, you know, the reality is I think we're all a work in progress. And I think particularly, I found it very valuable to talk to people outside of the company on coaching matters. You know, because like when you're an executive leading a team, you need to absolutely be vulnerable and share things. But there is this thing of, you know, being too vulnerable. <laughs> right? Hey, I really don't know what to do on this. I mean, I think it's okay <laughs> saying that some, but just don't say it every time. All right? And so I would use these coaches as a way to um, increase my capability. They just have more wisdom than I possess. You know? Yes, ma'am. Like, what sort of incentives do you need? Oh, yeah, okay. As much as people like to pretend that incentives don't matter, they do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. So here's here's what I was thinking of when I was writing this. Um, I can't tell you the number of times we'd be talking about a comp plan and people say, oh, that's not going to make a difference. Oh, baloney. It always does. You know, some of the most powerful things that um, I think we ever pulled off from a leadership point of view was when you make a very clear target. Give people, ask people what they need to make it happen, and then reward them for doing it. Oh, it happens. It happens. So you know, they don't say, "Oh, you don't have to pay me for that." Okay, fine. Oh, I don't want to be recognized. You know, thou does protest too much. Okay, and so I, I think that what happens is it's just this magic little galvanizing effect. It, it pulls it together. Um, and you know, I've been studying these psychological mental models about it. Okay, just because I'm, you know, I'm nerd. And I, I think that really the more I study, the more I, I believe it. And you know, the incentives aren't necessarily just a comp thing. It's you know how we treat each other. It's all sorts of stuff. Okay, but we respond to that as humans. So that's what I was getting at there. Yes, sir. Don't worry, I got pages of this. Dude. Oh, you sure got you pages yourself. I think it's actually. I was going to ask about number six as well because in Rackspace, uh, you have a culture that you're trying to promote of fanatical customer support. Yeah. I know that not even having worked there, but I know I know that yeah. about Rackspace. So. You're not trying to incentivize that behavior, though. I mean, because if you if you you don't want to be paying off somebody to adhere to the culture that you have That's correct, right? So, what kind? Of, how do you draw the line with the incentives? Where you're incentivizing certain behavior, but other things you're just supposed to adopt because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Okay. So, I think that's a good question. All right. So, I think um, let's deal with an incentive around a customer outcome. Okay. So, we would have incentives around churn, for example, or to say positively incentives around customer retention. Yeah, those are mathematical equations. And so that is rewarding people for scoring a touchdown. How you score the touchdown, entirely up to you. All right, so um, to keep with the football analogy, you can, uh, whether the Longhorns beat the Sooners, I don't know how I didn't watch the game, I just know they won, so they probably had a running touchdown, a passing touchdown, maybe an interception, the run back for a touchdown, who knows. So my view is, as long as people act consistently with the values, they're free to innovate. And the incentive is about the outcome of the task, the, the achievement of the final goal. And so from a hiring point of view, I would scream uh, on values big time. You can't teach people to be nice. Yeah, that was their parents' job kind of thing. Um, so if they show up to you and they're not nice, you know, good luck, blah, blah. Okay, not gonna happen. Um, but we can teach them you know, what the outcome is and then set them free to do it. So that, that's how we would cut it. Does that help you? All right, you guys ready to go on the next one? Oh, sorry, one more? Well, number eight. Well, brother, what do you want? Number eight is good. Number eight. Oh, yeah, people have greatness within them. Yeah, okay. So, look, I really do think people are special. 
in that you have this basket of talents and strengths. And so I think as leaders, uh, if you want that discretionary effort for competitive advantage, we have to create the conditions under which people will volunteer it. I don't think you can force me to perform at a great level. I think that is something that comes from within. You know, it, but it's an intrinsic thing, not an extrinsic thing. But, and so I think connecting, you know, from an EI, using EIQ models and stuff to connect around those intrinsic motivators, I think is where greatness is found. And I think as, you know, when we think about the best people we've worked for, you know, one of the best bosses I ever had is this guy named Rick Gordon. And man, I, I'd lay down on the tracks for that guy today. And you know, he did so much for me, he taught me so much. Um, and I had this other boss, George Morris, you know, if he's drowning because I want to be a good guy, yes, I'll throw him the life vest. Okay, <laughs> but I don't really want to. <laughs> okay. And so that's the difference to me. You know, Rick could pull my best stuff out and I'd volunteer for him. George, man, I, I just don't like that dude. Yeah, so this is how life goes, okay? All right, see, so we'll go to another one, okay? Um, I like number one, small teams are magic, large teams are tragic. <laughs> um, you know, hopefully everybody knows that by now. You know, it's impossible to uh, triage anything through a large team. Anything else on this page you want to talk about? Can you read it in the back? Number two. Number two. Oh, yeah, I do think there's this whole long-term thing that's really powerful. Okay, so, um, you know, we live in this world of instant gratification, and everybody, you make an investment today, you want to pay back today. Look, admittedly, I think early on in corporate development, you know, it's just infant mortality time. So we're literally trying to make it to next month, you know, next year or whatever it is. Okay, but I think the more perspective you have around a longer term outcome, the more likely it is that you'll get there. Okay, and the more likely it is that you'll, it, it, I think long term outcomes basically allow you to achieve things that others just won't do. You know, I can remember uh, lots of investment decisions. And you think about our society today, as a business person, you could probably make a one year, two year investment decision, right? But we need the government to make 30 year investment decisions. There's this thing called demographics, right? They actually are the keepers of that. They know what's going on. But because we have an election cycle, they're making two year decisions like the rest of us. Okay, and so I, I think the notion in business, when you look at public companies going quarter to quarter, right, they don't make five year decisions. So it's hard for them to play the long game. It's hard for them to make uh, decisions that have a J curve that pay off later. And so my point in this is really, you don't have to make a lot of those, but if you can just make a handful of them, I think you're significantly more powerful. Yes, sir. It's not on your list, but it's something you mentioned earlier, which is focus on one thing ruthlessly. But in that yeah. context, how do you deal with doubt? Doubt that might lead you to focus on more than one thing. So at some point, did you say, I'm not sure fanatical support is it. Maybe you need that support and the most secure, or and computer power agnostic, or and right. how do you deal with doubt? Right. You know, doubt's difficult. All right. I don't think I have a, a panacea for you on it. I, I think doubt is, while difficult, I think it's also good. Okay, so here was how I, um, you know, I kind of walked around paranoid. I still do to some extent, okay, about what I'm doing and how to make things work. So one way to deal with doubt from my perspective is to have experiments going on in a small basis, okay? Uh, and so that way you're, you continue the learning. So I kind of think of things like horizon one, two, three. Horizon one's the here and now. You know, is what is the core of what we are doing? How are we investing in, in making that awesome? That the statements and the conviction around that ought not to change. Okay, but when you get farther out, when you think about things three, four, five years out, I think there's plenty of doubt there. And to me, doubt there really just means uncertainty. Hey man, I don't know. I don't know what it ought to be. Uh, and so I think that's where we would try to run experiments. You know, some worked, some didn't. Okay, but that's how I would personally deal with it. And then the other way I dealt with it was uh, with that roster of coaches. Just so I'd have somebody hold up a mirror and smack me around. Yeah, because I need that. It's uh, no, therapeutic. Hmm. Yes, sir. Number eight, uh, the balance between conflict. <clears throat> oh, yes, yeah, but... mind conflict. I, I think that, um, you know, one of the, I'm a fan of Pat Lencioni's work. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not familiar with that, I'd encourage you to you know, geek out on that one a little bit. I think that conflict, when you have it in the workplace, is actually a really good thing so long as you work the problem, not the person. And that within conflict, you know, different views get exchanged. Uh, and so therefore there's, you know, there's gold in them hills. You know, there's treasure in there. Uh, and so I think the more we can get comfortable with it and do it productively, I think the faster we will learn. Okay, it's the opposite of having, surrounding yourself with yes people. Right, I think yes people means we are all redundant. And we all don't love us. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. 
So on the number seven, how do you help people systematically make their position? Oh yeah, seven's tough, dude. Okay, this notion of seven is, I think when we all have entry level positions, life is very clear. And then the higher up we rise or the more we build, the more ambiguous things become. Back to the doubt question. Okay, and, and so now the, now the issue is, well, how do you help people get more comfortable with that? You know, I don't know. Full disclosure, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's just an observation that I had. Um, in my experience, people kind of get there or they don't. I don't think I can take any credit for helping those get there that did on this metric. I think there's this, some people on the planet crave security more than others. And I think there's this weird counterintuitive thing that the higher up an organization you are, people think you're more powerful. Ah! Some ways, man, I just, you know, I think it becomes less so, okay? And, but the notion is the higher up you get, I do think the world's more ambiguous. You know, whereas the, the, the lower you are, the more clearly defined things are, the easier it is to know what the path is. So it's hard, man. Is there somebody else said something? No, you want to go to the next one? Okay. Quick question. When, when you, know, you guys were a small company, Rackspace, and yep. a very large company now, so number one, large teams of projects. So yeah. Was there any any kind of hints and, and, and advice or things that you learned along the way that you know, to try to? Yeah, sure. I, I think that um, the way I would describe it is I would rather be a company of a lot of small teams than one big company. Um, you know, I think anytime teams have more than you know 10 people on it it's hard look i prefer to go to meetings with four people in them instead of eight you know and i don't know whether it's we all just like to talk a lot so you gotta you know the fewer people are better or if there's really just a better exchange of ideas um but i i personally think that small teams can kick a big team's butt and then you guys did that in the rock spaces you tried hard to look i think it got away from us man you know I have no doubt that what I think happened there would actually happen there. There's some space <laughs> right? between those ideas. I can tell you, I aspired to be a big company full of small teams, you know. Um, but you know, there was one of me and you know five thousand others. Okay, but I think generally we did. I think generally we did. Yes. Um, I'm interested in go back and do it all again. And I do work in a lot of space and I will say it does feel like a small team within a large company. So I think from my perspective anyway. Oh, it helps. <laughs> <laughs> That's called legacy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so your question is what would I do differently? Oh man, 10 million things. Okay, I think my biggest mistakes were hiring, particularly that HR area. Okay, you know, I got a big on that multiple times. I think we were slow on cloud. Okay, so I think that's a you know, strategic error. I think we were slow on embracing uh, workloads outside of our facilities. You know, companies starting to do that now. Okay, so I think that that was an error. I would have um, I'd have put more in Austin Center. You know, I think San Antonio, while look, I you know have a home there and stuff. I think it's not as good a talent market as Austin is. Okay, so I think that was hard on it. Uh, what else would I do differently? What's your main ones? Okay, you guys ready for the next slide? Okay, this is the last one. I only discovered three slides. <laughs> okay, so uh, my favorite one on this is number 10. I think you get the team you deserve. Okay, look, that's hard that loving, mean? you know. What does that mean? Well, look, I think when you're a leader and you're complaining about your team, it's your fault. You're the leader, dude. You put them on the team, you coach them on the team, you say, yep, go do this, home slice. So if your team blows, it's your fault. You know, so I really do think leaders get the team they deserve. I already did my number three here. People with lots of metrics can justify anything. I also like you can't teach talent. Of course, I like them all in room. <laughs> Anything else y'all want to know on this slide before you can launch your scud missiles at me? <laughs> Number seven. Playing for greatness is worth it. Okay. Yeah, so admittedly, I'm a cheese ball. Okay. And what I mean by that is, um, man, I, I like things that are great. And I haven't been around great that often. Okay. Um, and so I think it's worth holding out for. You know, I, I think there's a big difference between going through life uh, on a 10 point scale, getting an eight versus a 10. And I think a lot of the world settles for that eight 
And personally, I want to have a 10 life. You know, my wife and I, uh, we've been married 21 years. Man, I got a 10 marriage with her. I love that woman so much. And she loves me too. I mean, it's freaking awesome. Okay, and I just think that's how we should go through life, dude. I don't, particularly in the workplace, you know, I mean, we can build anything. You know, we're all getting going here. Let's build something great. I mean, let's not settle. Um, so that's what I mean by it. And I, I find um, extra energy in the notion of that 10 out of 10. I mean, we all have different ways of channeling and thinking about it. But I actually, I oh mean, I look at my kids, kids and I want to be 10 out of 10 dad for them. I really do. And, you know, that's, um, that's where I need a coach. Um, so that's how, I, that's how I think about it. Yes, sir, in the back. Number five. <laughs> Number five, a company will only grow as fast as it can manufacture leaders. Yeah. So I, I generally think that, um, you know, the organization was a human innovation. The corporate organization was a human innovation, what, uh, early 20th century, basically. Uh, you know, prior to that, we were family businesses and partnerships. Okay. So the corporation took that innovation to the next level. And I think within a corporate structure, leadership really matters. It really matters, particularly as talent has become more distributed throughout organizations. So ultimately, when you're trying to build something fast, I think you have a um, balancing loop around your ability to manufacture leaders internally. And it's one of those things that, look, I think you can adopt leaders from the outside and that helps. All right, but one of the things I screwed up, back to the question earlier, was for a while at, at Rackspace, we fell behind on our internal ability to develop directors and above. Um, we hired a bunch of people from the outside to try to fix it. Anytime you hire from the outside, you know, the risks go up. And so we missed on some of them and we had a little culture rework to do, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think the better strategy would have been to figure out how to develop, you know, 75% of what we needed anyway and then supplement with 25 because a little diversity is always a good thing from a diversity of thought perspective and bringing people from different places and whatnot. Um, so that's what I mean by that. I think ultimately, you know, building a company is a human performance act and that act requires leadership. And so if you want to build something great, you got to be able to produce great leaders. And how do you do that internally um, as a CEO? Yeah, yeah, so I think lots of ways, actually. Um, you know, generally, when you think about tactics around it, okay, I always kind of come back to first hire wisely with good materials, you know, capable people, good values, all that kind of stuff that are leaning in. And then I would give them assignment after assignment that stretched them. Okay, and it's hard to do that at scale. It's hard to do that for 500 people. Okay, so, you know, I, I kind of believe in these weird asymmetric you know, power law outcomes that if you take the, a handful of the right people, that's kind of all you need, all right, to get you a long way. Okay, so make them super. You know, your top 10% of your company can do incredible things, right? Take care of them first and then work your way down. All right, and that way, you know, at least you're gonna get a parade of efficiency. Yes, sir? So as you guys grew, uh, how did you manage going from very small and very nimble to larger and larger. To larger and slower and less agile. Or how did you do that? <laughs> Natural way of things, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, so what's the question I interrupted? I guess the question is, uh, what kind of, what were your strategies to make sure that you guys were still, you know, focused on the right goals and, and nimble enough to adjust when things changed? Yeah. Well, I, I think that um, a, a couple things around corporate agility. Okay, I, I think the best thing for corporate agility is actually trust. Okay, and that's kind of a weird answer to that question. But I think ultimately, um, if you have a lot of trust inside of a company, people will take risks and speak up. And there's, you need that feedback loop if you're gonna be agile. I mean, I guess a little bit back to the comment around conflict and things. Um, and so as, I think as companies uh, grow, I mean, my attitude is everybody who showed up every day, you know, bet their life on it to some degree. You know, their mortgage, their personal brand, you know, whatever it is. Okay, and so they're there to do a good job. And then as leaders, we got to create conditions under which they can do good jobs. And so part of making a company agile is, you know, grow a company horizontally, not vertically, in terms of how you organize yourself. You know, vertical erodes agility. Okay, so I used to count how many layers between me and a customer. Okay, um, I think that in terms of rewarding people, um, if you have a culture that engages people, they'll take more risks. They'll do more things. And then I think part of it as a leader is you just gotta be comfortable with change. So we actually had a core value around embracing change. All right, and it's uh, change is tough, change is threatening. And so one of the, the coaches, this weird guy named Stan Slap, what he told me is that the key to pulling off change is to tell everybody what's not changing. He's like, ah, oh, 
Now, yes, I still love you. you know? So I think it's one of those things, right, that it didn't occur to me that that's what it is. Prior to that, I was advocating for the change we had to make. But really what's going on inside people's heads when change is going is the fundamental question they want to ask, but they don't articulate, hey, dude, am I still safe? The way people feel safe is you tell them what's not changing. And they hold on to that, right? And then it's easier to embrace the new things. Okay, so I think ultimately a lot of this stuff around remaining agile is being able to connect, having, having leaders be able to connect in a scalable manner on those issues. Does that help you? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Could you explain further on number one? Number one, the faster you grow, the faster things break. Yeah, okay, so I had this great coach named Carl Iskren. He built this company called Owen Healthcare. And he, they went from zero to two billion. He sold it to Cardinal Health. Um, I met him at Rice. And basically, when, I used to freak out because we were going fast. I felt like we'd fix a process and nine days later it'd be broken. And I'd be all stressed out. So I went to go talk to Carl once and I told him what's going on. He said, you're so dumb. I said, what do you mean I'm dumb? I'm doing great, dude. And he said, no, no, no. He said, if you were growing 15% a year, that fix would have lasted two years. He said, not, you're growing 50% a year. So yeah, you broke it six months later. That's all it is, is that the, the insight was the faster you grow, the more things break. As long as you're breaking new things, hey man, that's progress. Okay, and even when you re-break some of the same things because your process is now outside of that boundary and outside of that capability, that's progress too. And so I just think that if things are, it's a little bit like skiing. You know, if you go snow skiing and you never fall down, I don't think you're trying hard enough. Okay, and I think it's the same thing with growth. If you're growing and things aren't breaking, you're not pushing hard enough. Okay, and so the insight he gave us, look, breaking things is expected when you're growing. Don't beat yourself up over it. Yes, sir. From a product perspective, number two. Yeah, yeah, complexity maybe, kills. Some examples yeah. maybe that you have? That yeah, you know, I, um, things I screwed up, uh, I made it too complicated for us. Okay, too many products, too many geographies. And, and, and complexity is one of those things that um, if you have systems to keep up with complexity, it's okay. So take the United States Armed Forces, right? We are probably the only country in the world that can take 500,000 people from our country, equip them, move them to the other side of the planet, and have them prepared to fight. I mean, that is a serious piece of complexity, and we have the systems and infrastructure to pull it off. I think it's the same way in a company. You know, when you're trying to run, a, when a company goes from a single product to a portfolio of products, there's a series of systems and decisions that have to be made in order to make that happen. Okay, if you can't keep up with those systems in order to make that happen, that complexity will kill you. All right, I think uh, so. Let's take an automobile example. All right, so if you look at General Motors, when I was a kid in the '70s. Every General Motors car looked the same, right? They just put a different brand on it, okay? And so to me, that was an example of, they had all these brands, they wanted the market to believe there were all these different offers, but their systems couldn't handle the complexity. So an Oldsmobile was the same thing as a Cadillac Cimarron, same thing as a Buick LeSabre, same thing as a Pontiac, whatever. Okay, and so I think ultimately, GM couldn't handle the complexity, so they ducked it. They just took the same car and relabeled the brands, you know? I think inside of companies, uh, complexity is hard. Human beings are good with first and second order effects. We aren't good with fourth, fifth, and sixth order effects. And complexity creates those effects. Yes, sir. Oh, would you explain number nine, please? <clears throat> number nine. Oh, yeah, okay. By the time a problem reaches you, it probably meets its complex problem, so there isn't a simple solution. <laughs> yeah. I, I tend to, to discover over time, I mean, if it was easy, somebody else figured that one out and got a victory lap already. And that the stuff that hit my desk was by definition hard, you know, and I think that's how it goes when you're the leader, right? Whether you're the leader of the team or the leader of a company or the leader of a whatever, you know, I, I think if you're the leader by the time it gets to you, dude, if it were an easy solution, it's probably already taken. Not that every now and then I pull an easy solution and grab it out of my hat, but most of the time it was freaking hard. You know, people are mad at each other, they don't know what to do, we're losing money, blah, blah, blah. You know, all this stuff happens. Anything else? Yes, sir. What do you bring to the table, you and your team, that you didn't get from your investors? Okay, yeah, so for my investors that are listening, I still love you. Um, <laughs> you know, I, here's the difference. Okay, I think that um, whether we were a private company or a public company, I think the investor class, and I do think we have a class, kind of think that are charge. All right, and it used to drive me bananas. Because they would say things like, my company. I'm like, dude, come on. You know? 
3,000 people work here. You were one guy that wrote a check nine years ago. <laughs> so, yeah, this is your company, exactly. And by the way, it wasn't even their money to check. All right, so I, I think that what I am searching for and want to provide is that, that it's beyond an investment, that it's, you know what, we only want to make two investments a year, maybe three. We want to do it with people that are cool, that we want to hang out with, and we want to go on 20-year missions with them. And look, we're writing money out of our own account, I and mean, it's our money, okay? So we're gonna think deeply about it. And then along the way, I don't wanna be CEO guy again, it is your show, dude, okay? And really, if the stuff hits the fan and it's the middle of the night, I wanna be your second call, okay? I don't wanna be your first call, it's the first call for years. Hong Kong's in trouble, great, you know? Typhoon, whatever, wonderful, okay? Um, I'd much rather be your second call. But I'm an insomniac, so I'm happy to be call number two, and you're like, you know, I'll kind of warm up to it. Uh, and so the, the notion is, um, but we've discovered some things, uh, we've been blessed, and I want to share that with others. And I want to do it in a way that's committed around a long-term outcome, not a quarter-to-quarter -quarter result. All right? I felt tremendous pressure around last month's outcome for 15 years. Some of that self-inflicted. Some of that written in newspapers. Okay, and so I don't, I don't, I don't think that's the way to build greatness. You know, and so what I'm trying to solve for it is how do we have investor company relationships that are more about a collaborative outcome and destination than it is about measurement. Look, I'm a capitalist. As long as we're keeping the score, I'm gonna to try to win, okay, full disclosure, right? But I want the tone of it to be very different. That's what I'm after. I have great empathy for y'all trying to build things. And I can remember asking, you know, man, these wonderful public market investors that would say things and you're like, you need to grow faster. No shit, Sherlock, what are you going <laughs> Oh, if only I thought about that last week, you know, you can't get butt this week. You know, it just happens, dude. And so I, I just want more than that. You know, I want to be able to help. You know, I want, I want to create those conditions for you. Yes, sir. So, related to your last comment from the investor, he says you need to go grow faster. Yeah. Uh, did you also wonder, compared to what? Did, what what's his reference there? Is it, is it oh. in terms of... I think no matter how fast we grew, I was going to get that feedback from that fellow. Because the metrics that I just read about you, you grew really fast. I mean, you yeah. you killed it. We yeah, we did well. You know, five thousand people over there, you know, made that happen. Yeah, um, I know. But as as CEO, looking at your performance, the metrics that I saw from you, you were like what. Head and shoulders above the average. First of all, I like the way you think, dude. <laughs> so look, what I would say is that there, um, when it comes to growth, uh, investors' thirst is insatiable. You know, and then sure, I guess there are benchmarks that people would apply, um, but I, I generally think it's just an insatiable thing, and that it, it's a, it's just a, you know, it's just a loop. They go, woo, woo, grow faster, make more money. Okay, what are you gonna do next year? Grow faster, make more money. That's what I'm gonna do. You know, so I, I think that's all it is. I don't think there's a, a deep thought around it. Yes, sir. I'm not on the slides. But yeah, no, I'm done with the slides, dude. That's Sorry. all I got. You started. I'll show you the ones that didn't make the cut. Okay. That's my horizon one, two, three. And then instead of giving you season, Dr. Ebo is gonna do kind of like human development. <laughs> that's it. Yep, there you go. When you were talking. <coughs> about the uh, employee uh, retention and building a better retainment policy. So working with an organization that was privately held that was absorbed by private equity, a lot of changes as a result of that, a lot of struggle in the employee retention. Are you going through that? We're going through that, yeah. Oh, wow, yeah, that's complex. So I'm just, that's the complexity I'm talking about. Yeah, but I'm just curious if, um, you made reference to Gallup, is that, yes, sir. that a really good place to start with that? It is, I do think it's a good place to start. Ultimately, um, we ended up doing Net Promoter at the employee level as well, that we had sort of one metric across employees and customers, okay? okay? And then I just think from a leadership point of view, generally speaking, people are good. Okay, as much as I wanna bash lawyers or investors or whatever, people are good. Okay, and so when we have disagreement, I think it's because there are gaps in information and a lack of alignment around the outcome really going for, we're really going for. And so I think as the leader, the better you can bridge that gap and connect people, you know, the better off, the easier it will go. You know, to me, the best leaders unite, they don't divide. You can look at the US of A, you know, a lot of our elected officials today divide instead of unite. Okay, so, you know, inside of your company, if you can unite private equity investor with leadership team, with what customers really want, you're the man. 
<laughs> okay, so aim high, baby. <laughs> Anything else you want to ask? On the left. Yes, sir. Um, what's your take on the lay of the land of uh, the technology startup world in Austin right now? Oh, okay. The, so my lay of the land, the technology startup world in Austin. First of all, I think it's awesome. Okay, I'm having a great time. You know. Um, so here's what I think is going on. Uh, I think Austin's not yet seen its best day. Okay, I actually think that the um, back to that compounding thing. You know, miracles take time, and so you look at the the difference between compounding and regular interest. It takes a while to kick in. Okay, so I, I think that uh, we have not yet reached that kick-in part, but I think it's coming. Okay, everybody I meet in Austin is from someplace else. How many of y'all actually grew up in Austin? <laughs> Just that I was born here. Okay, look, I was born here, but that don't think that really counts. I was an accident when my parents were in school. Okay, <laughs> Drew, dad passed his PhD, I showed up in my unicorns later. Okay, so I, I think that what um, we have here is so I think Austin's hitting a tipping point. I think the talent here is impressive. The fact that everybody, almost everybody in this room is from someplace else, to me means everybody is self-selected for this place for a reason and a purpose. You know, they're leaning in, they're trying to do things. If they were happy with the status quo, they'd stay where they're from. Okay, but instead people here selected something different. And so I think we have the right human sort of mentality around creating and building things. I think what we don't have yet are these innovative breakouts. And I do think that it's just like in sales, you know, one win begets another. Inside of a company, one great hire begets another. The city's had a couple of breakouts, but you know, back to the introductory comment, you know, we haven't had a series of 15. Okay, so we, so I think the way it will start is today we have a lot of startups, and then we have a handful of larger companies. And what will happen is these startups will start to hit escape velocity. You know, this is why my strategy point, you know, is really about find that reinforcing loop. You find the reinforcing loop inside your strategy, it'll be an incredible growth outcome for you. And you'll go from, you know, whatever you're doing today to hit escape velocity to graduated into a larger company, okay? And then you just gotta add more loops over time. So I think for Austin, the sooner we find these loops inside of our businesses, and the more we invest and manage and cultivate those loops, the sooner we will have these breakout companies. Okay, and I think it's gonna happen, right? I could have stayed in San Antonio, I didn't. I bought a house up here, you know, for a purpose. And so, look, I feel like I was born here, it took me 44 and a half years later, and I'm back, okay? Um, and I think it's wonderful, man. I think it's, I think it's a cool spot. Traffic's a problem. I gotta get a small car, drive a suburban, that's not good. Hard to park, hard to maneuver, but it's you know it's good for my dog. So it's you know challenges. Yes. So I'm sure you're aware that about five percent of women backed companies get venture capital funding, that they have thirty five percent better outcomes than yeah. those backed by men. You want to know who my wife's venture backer is? No, I, I just want to know how you see, do you see that changing in the tech landscape? Question, please. Okay, sorry. You want to start over with a question? Sure. So I was just saying that uh, only 5% of women-backed companies receive venture capital funding, yet have returns that are on average 35% higher than those, back, yeah. than those led by men. Yeah. And I'm just curious if you see that changing in the tech landscape. You know, what's Which part of it changing, the returns or the number backed? Or all of it? All of it? Okay. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean. I, I do think, okay, so from, let's start with the returns. I think generally returns, whenever you have a large sample size, you have this reversion to the mean thing. Sure. Okay, which will happen. All right. Uh, in terms of the funding, yeah, I do think it's going to change. I just think we're more, um, I think it's a topic of discussion that it wasn't. You know, 15 years ago, look, I've only been in this business grand total of like four months, okay? So, you know, I'm extrapolating from a very small data set, okay? But I, I think that just, you know, being alive, to me, it's a, certainly a topic that's more um, on people's mind, okay? Whether it's STEM or um, this issue or board representation, you know, I think all these things are commingled, you know, and linked together. So, yeah, I actually do think it's, I think you'll have more, um, more uh, fundings, but I think the returns will be more mean like. And one of the things my wife taught me, so my wife's a radiologist, uh, and you know, for her, there were, she just had structural challenges, you know, when it came to, so when you think about that profession, man, work your butt off. You know, I mean, we met in college, so we met at Rice, then she went to medical school, okay, that's four years. Then she did residency, that was like seven years. And she did a fellowship, all this to read up freaking piece of film, which is now digitized. Okay, but anyway, so um, that's a long path, and it's a very specialist path. Okay, and then you have Mother Nature, 
issues around wanting to have a family. And so between the two of us, figuring out how to do that was interesting. You know, she was president of a group. You know, so now, I tell you what, you're much better off being president of a company than you are president of a radiology physician group. Okay, because doctors are impossible to manage. All right? and, and then the other stuff that she taught me is even within look, modern medical systems, there's a little, you know, we're in South Texas, and there's a little bit of good old boy stuff going on. And some of those guys would say stuff to her, and I'd want to go take those guys out. Okay, I mean, that was entirely unacceptable. All right? Um, but so she is in a little bit of a, a lens for me on these things. And so now, look, she started three companies. Okay, um, she only practices a day a week. Uh, and she's trying to turn it to her advantage. But she's, you know, she's a little bit of a weird nut. You know, I mean, she's this, uh, you know, she's tough, that one. Okay, so look, I want to believe it's going to get better. You know, uh, I took my daughter to work with me. You know, I, mean, I, I want all that stuff to get better. So I think it will. But I'm an optimist. You know, it's just kind of how I see it. What do you think people could do to change it? You know, so here's what I think people have to do to change it. All right. Uh, so to me, the the notion of um, the grass, we like to project that there's some panacea solution. Okay, I don't think there is, dude. Whether no matter what it is, we kind of got to look in the mirror and get our way through it. All right, I do think there are structural things and subtle changes that you know can be made. Okay, so for example, with sorry, my wife's name, Daisha. You know, when she would um, apply for financing and stuff, you know, I go with her. It's weird. You have all these studies that talk about how that doesn't make a difference. It actually does. And I didn't believe it. Okay, I don't function that way, but it just shows you how I'm clueless on things. All right, so I do think we have to take active nurturing um, activities on it to help it change. Uh, then I think what I want to believe is one success begins another. And that it takes time, but as long as we are showing traction around successes, it'll happen. Yeah, that's my favorite. Anybody else y'all want to know? I've got a question for you. Where behind you. <laughs> right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, God talking to me or something. <laughs> so uh, you had some comments about HR, or you didn't really elaborate on them, but. Yeah. Uh, if, if you don't mind elaborating on your comments about HR as well as talent management, how do you go about oh, okay. uh, finding and screening talent? Yeah, okay. So uh, comments on HR was just um, a, a few areas. I think HR is often treated as a cost. Okay, I would tell you I think you should treat it as an asset. You know, if you believe that um, people are incredible and matter in your company, you know, HR to me it shouldn't be administrative, but I mean, you have to do that stuff. But ultimately, the, the role of HR is to help you get the talent you need to perform at the level you need to achieve your outcome, you know, to achieve your mission kind of thing. Uh, so I, I think that uh, in dealing with performance management and talent management and hiring, I would encourage you to hold a real high bar on hiring. Uh, my hiring strategy is just a, it's one of attrition. Okay, so basically, you know, turn over every rock. Um, when you're interviewing people, I got a lot of energy. I would just go for hours and hours and hours, okay, until they basically could no longer BS me. Because the reality is, particularly people that are skilled, you know, that first two hours of interview, they can totally BS you, dude. Right? You know what I'm talking about. They've studied you. They went to your website. They can play back all your, you know, content. And you're like, wow, this dude's really on it. Nope. You know, they've read that in the car on the way over. They just know how to play it back. All right? And so my strategy on hiring truly is to just wear them down to where they can no longer trick you. And then you get to the truth. All right, and then I would form a hypothesis around that truth and reference people uh, for all their prior jobs. And there's this wonderful thing called LinkedIn. Whoever you want to reference, you can reference now. You know, what, whoever they used to work with, you can find it. And so I would do references of tiers. <coughs> I would say, oh yeah, call my old boss. Man, forget that. Okay, I'd call the old boss, but I'd call the boss three bosses ago. I'd call all the peers. And the best references I ever had are from the peers. Because the reality is I think we can all trick our boss Right, you can't trick the person you sit next to all day. Because they actually know what you're doing. They know you're playing, you know, draft kings or whatever it is that you're doing right there. All right, and so the more referencing you do at a peer level, I think the better composite picture you get. And then the last thing I would tell you is nobody's perfect. So I would rather hire somebody who's talented and know the risks and be able to manage those risks because I did a good job referencing than it is hold out for somebody perfect. Okay, you know, let's just make sure they're better than the last person we hired. That's called progress. <laughs> Answer for you? That was good. Okay. Uh, it looks like we have another question. No, it's no big deal. Oh, come on, ask the big one, dude. You're still trying to figure out how to bridge the private equity right. engagement divide. That's fine. If I, if I could shrink you down to the size of a pencil 
and it put you in a blender, how would you get out? <laughs> I'm not getting out, dude. I'm staying in there. All right. Staying in. You want me to give you the in internship answer? Well, anyway, okay, sorry. Anything else y'all want to know? I've got another question for you. Oh, like a nolly, okay. <laughs> so you mentioned uh, re relentless focus in positioning. And yes. of course, uh, Rackspace's focus was uh, fanatical customer support. Yes. Um, how did you come to that as positioning? And is, yeah. is there a method to that kind of madness? Oh gosh, I don't have a, a, a formula for that. I, I think the method is just discovery. And the reality is that came from a tech um, in the year 2000 during a meeting. Uh, so it's nothing that any executive or marketing department dreamed up. It was literally an offhand comment in the meeting that people listen to. But I would say it took four years to get comfortable with that being a strategy because it's back to this notion of there's so much noise out there and analysts would say, oh man, fanatical sport, you're a chump. What you need is 20 data centers or you know all this stuff. And so it took a while to embrace us that that was our unique superpower, that that was the thing we could be best in the world at, that that was the thing we could own. And it was nice to kind of this little catchy word fanatical in it. You know, um, so it, I would say it took three or four years for us to realize that that should be the strategy of the company. Um, and so maybe that gets back to that question of doubt, because we had doubt for that three or four year period mm -hmm. about how to embrace it. On the outside, it's what we talked about, it's what we communicated to the world, but on the inside, we're like, holy crap, man, maybe that's not it. How were how you able to overcome the doubt? Well, were, were there any stories you know, during you know, these what I would tell you is, uh, what overcame it is it freaking worked. <laughs> you know, I think winning cures a, covers a lot of sins. You know, and so because it was working, like, yeah, well, maybe that's it. You know, <laughs> you're eating the dog food, dude. You know, so so I think, and also, I think what we discovered over time is it became a um, way for us to express our mission in a way that wasn't, you know, to be the biggest or the best or whatever. It was no, no, we're the home of an apple support, and for us, that was a greatness statement, along with you know something that we actually wanted to do. I do. I, have, I do have a real one. Have now a nickel in a blender? No, I'm not a blender. Okay. Well, that's Blue Ocean strategy. Are you yeah. talking right now? Yeah, yeah. In the startup space, do you think it's relevant? Or do you think you should focus on what you're more? You know, here's what I would say, home slice. I, I think that generally, um, I'm a dreamer. Okay, so I like the Blue Ocean stuff. The problem is, if I don't boil it down to something, all I do is sit around and dream. You know, and so I think ultimately, uh, if you want to try to have a hybrid approach, uh, dream on three things instead of one. That's great. Does that make sense to you? You know, until you know or until your confidence rate goes up, um, that's what I would say. I do like the book though, really good. I got the book, I got the ebook, and I got the freaking CDs. <laughs> that's, book, that's an old book. Yes, sir. Okay, this is the last one because I got it. You know, let's get out. Cool. So you talked a little bit about Austin and you know the, the couple of breakthrough companies that yeah. come out here. Is that is that just going to be a little bit? I'm going to take advantage of this and get too far. Is that part of the uh, is that part of the build group strategy to invest in those? Yes. Okay. And what will when you're looking at companies, what what are some of those things that define those companies oh. that you think that are going to be those? Yeah, yeah, companies that have the potential. Yeah. Okay. So um, look, I I start with competencies of people. All right, because um, however you want to describe it, I mean, for me, all this is personal, actually. Okay, um, you know, I want to work with people I care about because I'm just going to work. I, mean, I worked till one in the morning last night. Those silly musings, you know, um, I, I care about this stuff. And so my first screen is, I don't care how great you are, you know, if I don't actually want to hang out with you, you know, eh, not going to work. Okay, dude. Um, sorry, so that's number one. Number two is. Um, I really do think about companies that have a, what I would call a secret sauce, a clarity around that secret sauce. And even if I, I would also say that most secret sauce is uh, transitory. You know, any competitive advantage a company builds today, I think is perishable and that it only lasts for so long. So the notion is let's find this first loop, you know, our nuclear fusion feedback loop, and then let's create new ones along the way. But you know, if you have clarity around the first one, you know, act one, so to speak, you have passion and a great team around that, and it's a technology that I can understand, <laughs> okay, you know, that's something I can sink my teeth into. If it's a technology I don't understand, I'm gonna put that in the too hard to understand pile and not do it, okay? Look, I'm only gonna do things that I can do, and you know, this whole room is humanity's competencies. 
My comp is the size of this laptop. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna do. I'm waiting for a fat pitch that I can crush. Okay, that I know how to help. Things that are, you know, sort of in the strike zone, I'm gonna pass on, man. I don't know anything about that, okay? Um, I'm not trying to make 100 investments, I'm trying to make three a year. And I don't know, 44, maybe I'll live 30 more years, and I get to make 100 investments, something like that. The last 10 years, I'm gonna take them off. Um, so that's how I see it. You know, I got 100 more investments in me, kind of thing. Uh, and I wanna make 100 great ones, and I want them to last 50 years. I'm not a flipper, I don't even really sell things. You know, I mean, I had this shirt for years. Okay, so I just think that I don't, the way I'm wired is, no, let's go on long-term growth missions together, and let's try to create a bunch of jobs, and let's try to change the town. You know, but I can only good for a couple of years. Thanks. Yes, sir. Okay, hey, thank you all, you've been a wonderful audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank everybody for coming. Um, we've got a few announcements here. One is that uh, uh, if you haven't already done so, Product Austin on Twitter, at Product Austin. Uh, you're welcome to follow Product Austin there. Um, also, uh, we've got on December 8th, Tuesday, December 8th, our next Product Austin meetup with Sean Ellis. And so you can go to Eventbrite, or I'm sorry, to productaustin.com, and there's a widget there where you can sign up for that event on Eventbrite. Uh, also, uh, we do not have an attendee survey to uh, complete tonight, as we often have in our past sessions. But uh, <laughs> that's good. There will be one tomorrow. It's got it, yeah. uh, you'll, be, you'll, be you'll be receiving one tomorrow, and we'll see how uh, Lanham's NPS turns out. <laughs> Um, don't forget that you can get your parking validated at the front desk, and we have two prizes to give out. Um, and those prizes will be awarded by Provocker if you talk to him after uh, after the, the, uh, the meeting here. Um, the first prize is going to go to the person who tweeted the most. And let's see who that is. While I'm bringing that up, actually, well, you know, if you could think of the person who had the most insightful or interesting or, or uh, something question that you would single out for the, the second prize. Uh, okay, I know the hardest out. question. <laughs> hardest question they asked me, right? That's what that? Hardest question I got asked tonight. Yeah. Yeah, yes. well, yeah, no problem. I got that one. <laughs> you already know what it is. That's what I had to answer. Uh, so it looks like Mark Steffen uh, gets the, the, Mark. The, the, the most tweets <laughs> All right, congratulations. So afterwards, just talk to Provocker and, and uh, he'll have some magical gift for you that he'll eventually deliver. Um, okay, are you ready? Yeah, look, I thought the hardest question was the one about um, creating the conditions under which we can have more women-backed companies, more women-funded uh -huh. companies. I think that's important. This so, question. so Mary uh, wins the other prize, so just talk to Provider after. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody for coming.